I'm Bill Roebuck, Executive Vice President at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Our program today focuses on Israeli perspectives on the post-October 7th set of interlocking Middle East crises. To examine these changes and evaluate Israel's emerging strategic outlook and regional position, AGSIW has assembled a panel of Israeli voices representing a range of perspectives. Our panelists today include Amatsia Baram, a professor emeritus in the Department of the History of the Middle East and founder and director of the Center for Iraq Studies at the University of Haifa. Dr. Baram is a scholar, strategic advisor, and media analyst of international reputation. He's published articles in the New York Times, the Financial Times, and Foreign Affairs, and been interviewed by most of the world's media, leading media outlets. Noga Tarnopolsky is a journalist based in Jerusalem. She has 25 years of experience covering Israeli-Palestinian issues, the United States and the Middle East, and European engagement in the region. Her recent writing can be found in New Lines magazine, Rolling Stone, and the Washington Post. Daniel Seidemann has been a practicing attorney in Jerusalem since 1987. He has argued more than 20 Jerusalem-related cases before the Israeli Supreme Court and has been frequently consulted by governmental bodies in Israel, Palestine, and the international community on matters pertaining to Israeli-Palestinian relations and developments in Jerusalem. And truth in advertising, I've known Danny for years and consider him a friend and a respected colleague. Our moderator today is Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at AGSIW and an incisive commentator on regional issues in American politics and culture. Hussein, over to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Roebuck. And I'm so delighted to have this uh, this panel together. We, uh, Noga is going to be joining us while um, going from uh, Tel Aviv to, where is it, Noga? Where are you going? To, to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It's a, there are books with that name. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, I want to I want to thank all three of you because I, I think um, you are three of the most incisive Israeli voices I know, and I have tremendous respect for all of you. And most importantly, you come from very different uh, perspectives and positions, and you will add. I, I think we're going to have a terrific conversation. So you know, I mean, obviously, what we're here to talk about is no mystery. Uh, the yeah. Hamas-led killing spree in uh, southern Israel uh, on October 7, and then uh, a little bit 8 and 9, and then the subsequent war in Gaza and the related crises uh, that are brewing in uh, the Lebanese border with Israel, um, in the Red Sea, which has taken a very uh, nasty turn uh, in the past 24 hours with a British ship struck and abandoned, um, and uh, U.S., service people killed in drone strikes in Jordan. So <clears throat> the region sort of on the brink of, of a, a potential regional war for the first time in living memory. Um, this is very serious. And I really wanted to bring Israeli perspectives in. Uh, just a, a sort of a, a contextual note. We began with Gulf perspectives. Uh, then uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had American perspectives with um, Tom Friedman, Judy Miller, and Frank Wisner. Uh, we have our Israeli panel now. We're going to give Palestinians the last word, um, putting together a Palestinian perspective panel um, that will be in, in the coming weeks. As soon as we can get it together, we will. Um, so I want to begin by asking all three of you to give us a general sense of where you think Israel is in at the current moment. Uh, in terms of its sort of thirty thousand, um, you know, feet view uh, from an airplane of where Israel is in this conflict, how's it? What is it trying to do? Let's let's just let's just narrow it down. What is Israel trying to do in Gaza, and how successful has it been so far? Uh, and what do you make of the entire project? I'm I'm going to begin with Noga just because ladies first, and we have to begin somewhere. So let's. Let's use some old-fashioned decorum. And uh, Noga, if you could begin by giving us your perspective on the big picture, and then uh, we'll have uh, Professor Baram and then uh, Danny Seidemann after that. So go ahead, Noga. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. And I apologize for the noise where I am. It should be, I'm going to hop into a taxi any minute now, and then it should be quieter. 
Um, listen, my bird's eye view right now is pretty grim. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There is um, less and less connection between what the Israeli government says regarding the war and what its army is doing. And some people see this in a way with a positive eye in the respect that um, the most extreme dangerous lunatic statements made by the prime minister and some of his ministers are not reflected in military reality. <clears throat> I actually see it, I understand that, but I see it as really, really, really dangerous because to a certain extent, I'm gonna use a radical word, which is not my style, but to a certain extent, <laughs> We're talking about a kind of, of anarchy, a kind of chaos in the administration of Israel right now. <coughs> Forgive me. So does that, does that come from a lack of consensus or just the style of governance? What do you mean anarchy? Can you elaborate a little bit? Well, when I say anarchy, I mean rules not being followed, um, norms not being respected. Um, I mean, what I just said to you in the respect of having um, less and less connection between what the military is doing on the ground and what the government announces its plans are for the war. <laughs> so I'll give you a very concrete example. We have seen uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in particular speak very bombastically, very belligerently, and nonstop now for about 10 days about a Rafa operation, the entire world, but I mean the entire Western world certainly, and our world, have to a certain extent fallen into his trap. In other words, he wanted to get attention, and man, did he get it. In reality, in, in reality on the ground, there's no Rafah operation. The last um, reserve brigades of the Israeli army have left Gaza. Sorry, here you're really experiencing Tel Aviv to Jerusalem live here. Um, so the last reservist brigades have departed Gaza. The, in real life, the Gaza ground operation is winding down now into a kind of maintenance operation. Um, and the reason it can't wind up further is that they have no guidance. The, the army, the commanders on the ground, the high command in Tel Aviv, they have no instructions from government. So Israel's not a society in which a coup d'etat is conceivable. The, the, the structure of the relations between society and the military just aren't that way. But when I say chaos, I mean the army's in the midst of one of its most, perhaps it's ma the major military operation. It has been in since the establishment of the state and they have no strategic guidance. Mm. They have no endpoint. They have no goals stated to them yeah. by the government. So all of this for me is a way of trying to depict in a nutshell a chaotic, volatile, and very dangerous situation. Okay, I really appreciate that. That is concise, for sure, and um, very uh, so sort of blunt. So I'd like to bring Professor Baram in uh, for his perspective, which I think may be somewhat different, let's say. I hope it's it will. It's different, but it is different. Um, I will start, uh, maybe I'll surprise you, I'll start from the north. I think that insofar as the North Northern Front is concerned, there is a reasonably good alignment between the military and the government, and also the majority of Israeli public opinion, basically Israeli public opinion. In short, nobody wants right now a fully-fledged war in the North. And uh, maybe I won't surprise you very much, but I think that this consensus includes also also a guy who is not known as as being a lover of Israel, but he's important. And his name is Hassan Nasrallah, yeah. who doesn't want to go either. Definitely not. No, no doubt about it. No. 
both sides right now. So there, there's a question. So what's the government and the military's vision? They don't tell us. They just do not tell us. But I think I know what it is. Uh, again, it's they are not very far from each other. I think even even uh, the radical right in the government and the chief of staff and and the, the general staff in Israel and the military are not very different in their approach. What should be done? But nobody is absolutely sure how it's going to go. So on the northern front, I'm less uh, concerned, at least when it comes to understanding between the various uh, various uh, powers in Israel. Uh, in even though there are many question marks, but everybody has the same question marks. Mm. Gaza, Gaza, of course, the the distance between the military command and the government is growing. I don't expect a coup d'état, but I do expect uh, many more losses, unnecessary losses, uh, in 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 uh, human lives, both. Uh, Israeli and Gazans, and uh, I do see a growing a, a trap, a growing trap in Gaza. Gaza is becoming like a huge trap for our forces, not because it necessarily has to be, not at all. It's because there is no decision. Hmm. And a lack of decision is a decision. Yeah. In other words, I just pointed out very simply, uh, everybody's talking, okay, do we need or do we not need to go into the day after? The day after is long gone. Yeah. We, are, we are deep in the day after. Right. Now, already. And if you don't dis- make a decision, a bold decision, and there is need now for really a Churchillian Chachil- a leader, which we don't have, uh, who is going to to lead the civil, the civil the civilian front in Gaza? Very simply, put very 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 succinctly, I'd say, and, and clearly and narrowly, when all the humanitarian aid is coming through, eventually through Egypt, after we check it and they go there and mm-hmm. so on, and yep. they go into into Gaza from Rafah. Mm-hmm. Who is giving food to the people. Very yeah. simple. Right. He or she, or those who would give food, provide the food, actually disseminate the food, create a good system that everybody gets enough, more than survival, enough for decent nutrition, whatever you call it. He or she or they will rule Gaza. It's yeah. as simple as that. Sure. And uh, if you want Hamas to continue and rule Gaza, you just don't make a decision on that. And the result is Hamas is taking all the food and doing whatever it wants with it, selling it, and making a lot of money on it. And of course, people are getting more and more angry, but they have no weapons and they cannot do anything. <clears throat> so even such a simple, basic decision like that. So uh, the military is now drawing forces out of Gaza because it's not yet going into Rafa, because the order to go into Rafa hasn't been given and won't be given so quickly and so easily. It's possible. Like, I don't want to make it uh, like, like mission impossible. It's mission possible. It yeah. needs a lot of preparations. Take a million point three people from, uh, from <coughs> the area into the center and, and catering for them. It's not just taking them. Or, yeah. Sending. So this is not be- being made. A decision is not being made. So we are, Israel is entering now in Gaza into a limbo. Mm. And, and the limbo is very, very dangerous because we are a small country. It's a small army and, and our economy is not fragile, but we are not uh, China. We are not Russia. Right. So and, and we are not America. So it's impossible to to keep this kind of limbo for much longer. Right now it works, but not for much longer. At a certain point, even the soldiers would decide, maybe I don't want to go fighting anymore. Certainly the reservists. Mm. So this is a dangerous point. And if we don't resolve this, if the government doesn't resolve this, then we are in in trouble. I just say, 
end up by saying one more sentence about the connection between the two fronts, North and South. Please. It is clear that uh, Hezbollah, Nasrallah, will not stop fighting. They don't want a fully fledged war, but they want a low intensity war or medium intensity war, as you know, with 100,000 Israelis away from home, refugees. Israelis, Jews, not Arabs. The Arabs stuck to their village in the north and they say, we won't leave. But the Jewish people, (laughs) they decided, hey, we are going to go somewhere else for a while. But for the last four and a half months, they are there. They are not there. The north is empty. So Nasrallah is not going to stop the war against Israel, the medium-sized war, until the war in Gaza is is ending. So, or the ceasefire at least. So this will go on f- also for, for forever. In other words, we are in deep trouble and the decision is, is necessary, a bold decision. Um, I'm going to ask you later on about what the bold decision would look like, but I, I just want to confirm before we go to Danny, uh, I'd just like to confirm that the failure you're talking about of decision making is a political failure in the war Absolutely. cabinet. Uh, okay, Absolutely. I just wanted to confirm that. A hundred percent political. Okay, very good. All right, <clears throat> let's bring in Danny Seidman, who I've known for ages and who is a don't... brilliant guy. Uh, yeah, Noga, go ahead. What is it? I just said that I don't think that Professor Baram and I actually disagree very no, much. No, not 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 very much. No, which which is really good in a way. It's very interesting. Anyway, um, Danny, uh, please give us your big picture take on where Israel is right now. Where does it think it's going? What does it think it's doing? And um, how's that going for it? My first word of advice is suspend linear thinking. Can you can you speak a little can you speak closer to the microphone or a little louder? Yeah. Is this better? Much better. Okay. Uh, Suspend linear thinking. Uh, I, you know, the Italian socialist uh, Gramsci said, uh, the old world order is dead. The new world is striving to be born. Right. This is the time of monsters. Yeah. Uh, to talk about Israel in generalities, I think, is problematic. Um, sure. The major insights, they're not insights. They're there for everybody to see is the trauma of October 7th, which has not dissipated and will stay with us a long time, uh, and disorientation. The world looks differently from what we expected and, and doesn't function the way that we expected. This comes against the backdrop of, I believe, the, the collapse of leadership in Israel. Um, I don't think a society, even in normal circumstances, can continuously be governed by somebody who has lost the respect of a majority of the country. And I think it's fair to say that that's the case with Netanyahu. By the way, this is symmetrical. Israel and Palestine are governed by people who are not trusted by their constituencies. Uh, Definitely. Um, We're disoriented. We're disoriented. uh, Um, The old discussions, one state, two state, red state, blue state, or whatever, um, people are concentrated, I believe, on the immediate. And there is a rift in Israeli society between those who prioritize incapacitating Hamas Mm -hmm. and those who prioritize the return of the hostages. Uh, And it's a big rift. And it exposes, I believe, a fault line in Israeli society, which goes very deep, and we will be dealing with in the months to come. Is it true, by the way, that uh, I hate to interrupt, but is it true that the 
the um, incompatibility or the contradiction to some extent, a uh, very large extent, between the agenda of, of crushing Hamas tooth court and of freeing the hostages, which are very, you know, prompt you to do very different things. Uh, is that becoming clearer uh, over time to people or? Yeah, and I, I believe it has, you know, perhaps too clear. Obviously, there's no perfect answer to this. Right. But the pro public perception is, especially among the families of the hostages, that Netanyahu is prioritizing incapacitating <laughs> Hamas, but also that his motives are not entirely pure. And this he's doing this for his political survival. Uh, how do you how do you think the chances of his political survival are? I mean, is he is he really zero. finished? A zero. OK, yeah, I keep hearing that. But then uh, uh, there uh, he is. I, look, I, believe I, I disagree. I disagree. But we can discuss it later. I, I'm going to come no, to you. I, next I, I'm, to I'm glad you do. But I, yeah. I look, I think that it is impossible to govern having lost the legitimacy in the eyes of virtually all of the elites of the society to keep us afloat. Okay. Uh, so I, I believe that his days are numbered. The question is, how many numbers? And yeah. I have often failed in estimating that, and and at one cost. Okay. Uh, um, thank you. No, go ahead. Finish your, finish your uh, just, overview. Just, yeah, a cu couple of words sure. about the Israeli public. Uh, I think the Israeli society reinvented itself twice in the last year. Once in deflecting <laughs> the judicial coup, which I believe has been fairly successful, perhaps conclusively. And secondly, by fulfilling the role of government, civil society in Israel is doing what government should do mm. and hasn't been able to do. Uh, I that's, think that should be a source of pride to Israelis. I think that the day after, I think already today, there is a sense that the day after this war, we have a state to build. I, I'm quoting hostages <coughs> coming back, people. There is a sense that we need a restart. That by no means... Uh, suggests that uh, all of a sudden Israel is going to embrace the two-state solution or a political process. But these are pivotal moments. We have an overload of pivotal moments twice in the past year. We're traumatized, disoriented, but there is a sense that we have to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you harness those energies in a way that will restore some semblance of the ability to proceed. Hmm. And you mean national unity to, or consensus, rebuild a national no, consensus? No, I mean, no? I, I, I mean, national unity is often used as a fig leaf for let's hmm. not decide on anything. But I believe <laughs> that what has been discovered is that there is a broad consensus in Israel on many things, and the future of Palestine and the relations of, yep. with Palestinians are not one of them. Right. However, there is enough solidarity in Israel to begin to work this out seriously. I hmm. doubt it can be done under Netanyahu. Right. Nothing good will come of Netanyahu. Okay, well, that, that's very clear. Uh, Noga, I'd like you to bear with me because I want to go back to uh, Professor Brown for a second before coming back to you, because... Uh, there, I have two questions for you, uh, Professor Brown. Let's do the first one. I, as for me, I, I don't know anything about Israeli domestic politics. I don't know Hebrew. I don't. I mean, I'm not qualified to judge, but I'll believe it when I see it. As far as Netanyahu leaving the stage, uh, you uh, express some doubt about that as well. Can you tell us where you think uh, the prime minister is in his political yes. future? Yeah. Uh, I've been talking to lots of people for during the last few months since October seventh. Uh, people who are not my, not politically supporting the same people I do. It doesn't matter really. My strong impression is that that our prime minister still has a very strong base yeah. in Israel. Yeah. It's not over. I personally would like, even though I appreciate many things he did in the past, but not the last few years. But I would be. Uh, 
recommending to him to to withdraw now and uh, remain an important elder, elder statesman. Well, he that's not him, and so and he's he's such a master of political political struggle. He's such a master. I doubt it. I, I doubt it that we ever had anybody m more gifted and, and clever than he is. Yeah. So I think that there is a very good chance that a we shall not go to a new electoral campaign at all until three years from now. I mean, when, when originally it was supposed to happen, or two and a half years. Uh, and even if we do. He has such a strong, such a strong body of support in Israeli society, despite everything that happened, and maybe now he, that he can, he can, he can, he can, he can, he can do what uh, what Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger said. Uh, I shall be back now. Yeah. Again, it's it's. So early to be certain about it, because by now all all public opinion polls are show, showing us no, no, no. He lost his majority. He is now he is a goner. But he is not because after the war or when the war goes on and on and on and on, and people are getting very worried about security and about safety and whatever. Uh, very slowly, people might might go go back to support him. I'm saying it based on Israeli history. That's all. So it happened before. It can happen yeah. again. Yeah. No, I think I think that's very smart. Uh, Noga, you're a very keen observer uh, of Israeli politics, and I'd like to get your view on the same question. What is the future of Netanyahu? And let me throw out something else. If he were to go, is it likely he'd be replaced by anyone substantially different on international you know, security, foreign policy, and Palestinian issues? You know, I, I'm sort of skeptical of both. What do you think? Um, thank you, Hussein. I, I first want to just throw out one little comment about the question that you asked, Danny, hmm. having to do with Israeli perceptions about the conundrum between rescuing hostages or crushing Hamas. Yep. The reason I want to just go back to this for a brief moment is that what we're seeing in Israel is a third element. What Danny said is correct, of course. That distinction is becoming more and more uh, vivid for Israelis. But more interesting to me is the are the polls, the recent polls, um, and the more trending polls that show that what Israelis actually think is that Netanyahu is acting for his own political interests, that he's not acting to crush Hamas, and that he's not acting to rescue the hostages. And this contributes to the general feeling of bafflement, I think, among Israelis, because it's hard to know what to do with that. And therefore, it does leave Israel um, vulnerable to a certain extent to further abuses from an already very abusive prime minister. Um, so that's one thing I would say, but it is interesting to me that just a growing consensus of Israelis perceived him, according to many surveys, as someone simply acting on his own behalf. Mm -hmm. Does that his... sentence him to the wilderness? I mean, you know. Sorry? Does that sentence him to the wilderness? Is he is his career finished, as so many people well, keep saying? Or does right. he have a very strong fighting chance, as Professor Baram thinks? Right. And I always suspected, but I don't know. Um, I actually... I see it a little bit differently in this case. First of all, I think that um, Professor Baram's advice to Netanyahu to leave and become an elder statement, statement I think that opportunity ended when mm. he turned down uh, the then Attorney General's offer, Avichai Mandelblit's offer, to accept a plea agreement. Remember that he's on trial, including mm. his trial was on today, in a fairly behind the scenes of war, and geo strategy. His trial was on today, and it was not another time, not a good day for the prime minister in court. Mm. So when he turned down the then attorney general's offer for a plea agreement, which would have seen him leave, in fact, I think as a kind of let's say grand dame, as a statesman, an mm. elder statesman of Israeli politics, when he turned that down, I think he showed us who he is. He has, and I also think that that ship has sailed. I think. No matter what happens, I believe now 
that Netanyahu will be remembered as a trickster who blinded Israelis and persuaded Israelis that he made all kinds of achievements, economic achievements, achievements vis-a-vis -vis Iran, during a period of time in which, in fact, he was chewing away at the institutions of state. Mm. And that when money time came, he tried to perpetrate a coup. And I, I believe that he will be remembered as the man who brought Israel to its knees in terms of security and in terms of economy. And I don't I think that that's what he's going to be remembered for in terms of his immediate future. Yeah, that's the more interesting I think question. I, I kind of I kind of have a, a middle road between these two esteemed gentlemen. I think that he is a dead man walking. Hmm. I think that he is dragging Israel right now into his own personal purgatory hmm. so that he has very little support. It's true that his support is very intense, but it's very intense among a rapidly shrinking, tiny, and extremist base that doesn't seem to be, you know, it hovers between 20 and 25 percent of Israeli voters. That may seem like a lot for someone who's brought Israel to such disaster, but it's consistent. And by the way, even before the war, he was Israel's most or least popular prime minister. He had about 27 percent support on October 6th because of his attempts to transform uh, the Israeli form of government into an autocracy. Now, I also think, I think that he's extremely dangerous right now in the way that Danny indicated at first. I think that he knows he's a dead man walking in his own way of knowing. I think that he will literally do anything to hold on to power. And I think that um, Israelis will need the help, Israeli citizens, We'll need the help of some powerful actors to get rid of him. And I'm not sure that those powerful actors, be they the unions, be they the coup ministers, I'm not sure they have the backbone to do it. So I think he's a dead man. I think he has no credibility among the huge, the vast majority of Israelis. 80% of Israelis want him gone. But I think that that makes him dangerous. And I think he will never leave. I think he will have to be kicked out. Um, I also okay. finally, sorry, I just want to close by saying one of the reasons I'm saying this is that we see that even in wartime, even as people continue to die in Gaza and in Israel every day, um, Netanyahu is pursuing the aims of his coup d'etat and continues to try to destroy Israeli institutions simply not through legislation this time. Okay. Uh, and one final question i mean i wanted to just want to follow up with you on that and and i'm going to certainly pose the same set of issues to uh the two gentlemen with you but let's you know continue with you uh if not that, let's put aside that Danielle's future for a second eventually he goes right because uh you know no one stays forever at the moment is israeli society becoming uh, more hardened? Is it moving to the uh, right when it comes to Palestinian issues? Is it becoming more intransigent and angry uh, and fearful? Or is it starting maybe to see the wisdom of making an agreement with those Palestinians who want to talk Palestine. rather than kill? Um, I think this is an extremely difficult time to ask that question. Okay. Because Israeli society is plunged into what uh, Danny Seidman described so well, a kind of bafflement. Israelis yeah. are in shock. They have no leaders. I mean, the, the leader Israelis trust most today is Joe Biden by a very, very long shot. So, yeah. and Joe Biden can reflect many things back to Israelis, but he can't reflect what Israel is right. to Israelis. No. So I think that there's no real answer. I mean, I think there's some indications that Israelis right now, after what happened October 7th, can't contemplate um, any kind of uh, political or diplomatic moves vis-a-vis -vis any Palestinian leadership. But I also think when we see the statistics that increasingly show a small but growing minority, a majority, excuse me, of Israelis who support halting the war even if temporarily and bringing the hostages home rather than your question about crushing mm. i think we're seeing a population that is also recognizing the limits of what its very powerful army can do 
And there's more and more talk in the public sphere about, and for military leaders, about how they need a framework. They need a geopolitical government framework to act in. So I think things, again, are volatile and it's difficult to answer. It's impossible to answer you right now. Uh, fair enough, but I'm going to press the two gentlemen on it uh, anyway. And with the with the caveat that now is a very hard time to think about these things, but also now is the time that Israel is being pressed on that, right? Because uh, the United States and uh, the Arab states that are most sympathetic to Israel are kind of coming together to present a vision that uh, has Israeli acceptance of the need to eventually create some kind of Palestinian state to, you know, the the details of which are to be determined by negotiations, but the goal of statehood to be accepted uh, kind of in a framework, you know, now, basically, or in the immediate future. Um, and in the United States, we have the sense that any major strategy the United States wants to um, uh, kind of pursue in, in the Middle East in the coming years uh, will be very difficult to effectuate as if Israel continues to say, as the cabinet just has, that it won't consider any form of Palestinian statehood. I'd like to begin with, with Danny. What do you think? Where is Israel go? The Israeli public and the Israeli polity, both the, the elite and the and the general opinion, uh, with, the, with the caveat that it's very hard to talk about right now, but where are they going when, as international pressure grows, to publicly say, yes, the goal is two states and just that. I mean, you know, but that's been that's very hard to say, apparently. The role. Can you speak a little louder, please? Uh, people are having a hard time hearing you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Let me just reorganize. Better? OK. Yes. OK. Um, Much. The, the regional and international calculus has been changing in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing about the possibility of a Security Council resolution of the United States. We're seeing accountability towards settler violence. These are the kinds of things that we haven't seen in the past. Mm -hmm. I think that's bad. I think the fact that we have been given a pass on all sorts of issues has not been healthy for Israel. I think many of our friends, genuine friends in the United States, are like the wealthy uncle who subsidizes our addiction to the crack of settlements and occupation mm. instead of sending us off to rehab where we should be. Having said that, I don't think that the Israeli public is ripe in any way, shape, or form to make large decisions about what the future looks like. And I think that that is a completely legitimate and reasonable response. Uh, we are suffering from an overload emotionally. We have to deal, no, no Israeli has been unaffected by this. Mm -hmm. there, there will be time. What I do say is, Make no assumptions of who the Israeli public will be mm. a day after the ceasefire. It is a seizable moment in which we Israelis, I believe, collectively, and it's not left, right, and center. There is mm. a portion of Israeli society that want to maintain the old order. It is an opportunity to reshape ourselves and perhaps begin the process of reshaping ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Um, I would highly recommend from facile uh, um, uh, conclusions, Israel is going to move to the right. There's no possibility of moving forward. We are condemned to this cycle. I don't believe that's the case. And I think that we are approaching a moment which can be seized. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tom Friedman's thesis, as he he said on the American version of this conversation a couple of weeks ago, is that that the um, Biden administration is trying to 
uh, force Israeli uh, public opinion and elite opinion to to recognize the moment of the inflection point that is looming and and to make the choice uh, you know in the coming months and year a couple, couple of years but i'd like to get professor baram's take on this where do you think public opinion elite opinion on these issues is is going now and and how do you react to what uh, the other two um, panelists have said well first of all i agree with both my colleagues that uh, right at the moment today uh, very few Israelis, maybe 20%, maybe 30%, but no more, can contemplate a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. uh, fully recognized, independent, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, and, and again, I think, like I think like then, it seems to me, that this is natural and this is normal because what happened on October 7th is we are back to Hitler. And I'm not joking. We are back to Hitler. I feel, I'm just saying what my own feeling is. Mm -hmm. I am back to 19, not 33, to 1941, 1942 in Europe, uh, with Nazi occupation of much of Europe. That's what I'm feeling. Moreover, I feel that there is Nazism in America Nazism in France, Nazism mm. in Britain, mm -hmm. Nazism even in Germany, mm. Germany least of all. But still, the, we are. This is a wave of Nazism in the world. Mm. Every Israeli is aware of it. And uh, certainly, do you, do you include the Israeli extreme right in that or not? No, no, no. I'm talking about the anti-Semitic. Oh, anti-Semitic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Anti-Semitism. Right. I understand. All right. we, had, we had today a speech by a South African politician mm. who threatened the Jews of South Africa with mass slaughter. Okay, I, no, I understand. Go ahead. Sorry. That's my, what I, my, my English is reasonably good, and that's what I understand. He threatened them with, with horrendous bloodshed. Mm. A South African politi politician. Mm. So uh, this wave coupled with the with the initial wave of uh, the murder slaughter burning people alive burning babies alive mm. rape mutilation of of october 7th doesn't allow israelis now it's really 70 or 80 percent of the israelis to even think about any palestinian state at all at any time so this is a very bad time to bring it up and i think that uh, by bringing it up the way the Americans did it, now uh, they actually helped the radical nationalists in Israel. Yes, right. Because, because when, when our prime minister is saying, is confronting the, the president of the US of A, over <laughs> there, then everybody says, oh, you know, even a, a, a watch which doesn't work at all can be right once. In yeah, 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 yeah. He gets. I, I'm sure he gets credit for standing up to to the powerful. Yes, and, that, state. and that's a mistake on the part of the American part. I, I understand, but here's the conundrum from from the global point of view, um, which is that now is not the time to press Israelis because they're traumatized and they can't imagine this, and the security implications are terrifying and all of that. But if you go, if you let the situation, uh, you know, kind of return to a sense of normalcy, then Israelis won't contemplate it because they don't feel there's any leverage over them. So, th you know, this is the catch-22. Like, no. I understand. No? Okay, go ahead. Explain. Please. I'll tell me why, why not. I'll tell you why I think otherwise. Uh -huh. Until the 7th of October, Israel was split more or less down the middle between those with some 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 more on the yes Palestinian state, not too many, but 50 50 plus and 50 plus for more, a little more than 50 percent for a Palestinian state, but the 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 um, condition upon which such a, a state could be acceptable to Israelis was and in the future will be again, I'm sure, Security. Yeah, well, of course. Security. Right. In other words, right. if you reach a an arrangement that looks looks to the Israeli authorities, public, whatever, 
as as a guaranteed security with international guarantees and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't go into the details. I have many, many details, but that's oh, a yeah. big... Then the Palestinian state looked as acceptable, even preferable, to around 50% of the Israelis, and well, maybe a little more, maybe not. But it wasn't reflected in government policy, uh, you know, for... No, no it was not, because government policy... Yeah. It was not reflected at all in government policy yeah. because of the kind of coalition we are having. But if you look at the, if you if you take away the question of uh, uh, Bibi's particular coalition of today, and just look at the whole Israeli Knesset, which is a good way of looking looking mm-hmm. Knesset members, how many of them, who of them, which parties, or would be sorts of. A, to whom it would look acceptable, and even as I said, even preferable to have Palestinians yeah. said on these conditions. I said you would find Thank out you. most, for example, just one example. Most of the uh, most of the um, ultra orthodox politicians mm. uh, can accept it, provided mm. that you have security. Yeah. Uh, 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 all of those who support guns, I mean, uh, uh, general whatever guns who is center center of center would be accept would accept it your ear uh, lapid people would accept it the left of course on the right on the right on the Likud, some might some not and then you have the other hand uh, yeah, uh, not yeah. but you yeah. you are still there you are still there right yeah. now the yeah. question is okay so what do you do if on the one hand you cannot tell israelis you have to accept the principle of a Palestinian state because you tell them they won't accept it mm-hmm. now on the other hand you tell them look guys if you don't do something you cannot solve the problem either with gaza or with the west bank and not even with the north right you're stuck then uh, well this is really the 64 million <laughs> thousand dollars question what can you do in order to 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 make a productive contribution and at the same 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 time not to rub in salt on the very painful yeah the raw wounds yeah. of of practically 99.9 percent of jewish israelis yeah okay but you have to do some but you have to do something is that is that conundrum do don't do anything is the conundrum of uh, uh, leaving it to military means and saying, look, we, we're not going to make a decision on any of this. We're going to leave it to the military to keep us secure while we don't make decisions. Um, is that enough leverage to move uh, the Knesset, the structure of Israeli politics? That's my <laughs> question. Because I, I'm sure you could move a lot of people uh, if you presented them with a reasonable plan, uh, but you'd have to get it done by a government that at this point isn't interested. So I'm just wondering, is that really, is that enough leverage ultimately to make a political difference? And that's for you, Professor Baran. I'm not sure what you are talking about. Oh, I mean, uh, you say that uh the the uh even though the israeli public is not is right now traumatized and is not ready to hear this that the problem uh as i understood you now you can correct me i may have misunderstood you My, what i thought i heard you say is that in spite of that there is this problem that if if israel doesn't make decisions you talk by the way let me well, let me let me stop here let me ask you what the churchillian decision that you referred to in the beginning is. What do you mean by that? I think that'll give us an entree into your analysis on this point uh, in a way. So uh, why don't you elaborate on that? Uh, one of the reasons why I never aspired to become a prime minister in Israel is exactly this kind of question. <laughs> but I will tell you, had I been the prime minister of Israel today, <laughs> not tomorrow, today, tonight, mm. I would say essentially two things. A, priority one are the kidnapped people. Mm. And I know that I'll get a little more than 50% support for that. Not that those who object to it are necessarily crazy or nationalistic or radical. Mm -hmm. or No, I understand their point of view. But I still think morally, a Chachilian leader in Israel should say, 
in so many words, getting the hostages back home, as many of them alive, still alive, right now is my first priority. Which means But making a deal, right? Making a deal, a painful <laughs> deal, yes. To get them out. I, yeah. I would immediately yeah. explain what kind of a deal I'm ready for, because not okay. every deal. No, I but, understand that, yeah. But that's not what. When it comes to the longer term, I would say we have to accept an Arab guardianship over Gaza right now, an Arab guardianship. Mm -hmm. I don't know what exactly actually happens, <laughs> but I, I, sh I shouldn't go into details. Mm. It's not a pipe dream. It's a possibility. An Arab guardianship with international, a combination international and Arab guardianship of okay. Gaza and immediately start moving. Number two, number mm. three, about the longer term, I would say, mm. a Palestinian state should not be counted out, mm. out of hand. But one has to, re so and tomorrow it won't happen. It will no, not it happen. Won't. But right. I am more than happy, I, as Prime Minister, I would say, it. I am more than happy to begin serious discussions with, uh, with um, the Americans, with the Europeans, with Arab leaders <laughs> and with the Palestinian leaders, people whom I believe have the right uh, intention, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, over how to do it, how yeah. to, what to do tomorrow, what to do the day after tomorrow. I have no problem with that, but it has to be clear that unless the security issues is solved mm -hmm. absolutely to our content, there is no Palestinian state. It will never happen. No, I understand that. No, I, that's that's what I would say I couldn't yeah. count out the Palestinian state's option mm -hmm. out of hand, as our prime minister is doing now. But it means, it means that if I'm now the prime minister, I'm losing my coalition. Okay, It's when I go, so that's the question. I, I want to go back to the other two panelists, but I just want to ask you to finish this thought and complete it. What is the realistic possibility of the current political structure in Israel producing anyone remotely like that who would ask those questions and give anything like the answers you just gave? Yeah, I understand, Danny, but I I'd can, like I to... Can, I can say what said this. After the next elections, it may be possible. Presently, it's okay. in. So you need an election. All right. Now, I, I want to ask Noga what she thinks of all of that, both as an analysis, in, in, not, in, not in terms of the, the agenda of Prime Minister Baram, but, uh, but rather the, the analytical structure of Israel's conundrum. And, uh, you know, can, uh, because, you know, if, if, if an Israeli Prime Minister undertook to enter into negotiations with uh, Americans, Palestinians, Arabs, towards, uh, you know, event the how to structure the creation of Palestinian state. That's what everybody's asking for. No one's expecting Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories, you know, now or anything like that. What they're looking for is a framework. Uh, so, you know, the question is, would, you know, is, is he right that after the next election you could get that? I mean, what do you think of all of this? Um, I think, yes, I think he's right that after what is currently a theoretical next election that could be possible. I don't discount it on outright. I think after a future theoretical election, a lot of things are possible. I think Israel could swerve uh, to a hard right. I think Israel could uh, not, could choose a kind of vision uh, of the type uh, Professor Baram is describing. I, I think, I'm saying this very cautiously, but I do think that given the immense shattering that happened in Israel um, on October 7th, I think we have a chance inside Israel of seeing new political constellations. But I have to say that right now, I don't see anyone in the opposition mm. um, who has the wherewithal to stand up and tell Israelis the truth, even risking a political position. The, the person who went closest to that so far and who may yet is Gadi Eisenkot, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm. Um, and he, you know, has a unique stature right now mm. as a former general mm. and as someone who suffered an almost incalculable loss during this war, his son, and then two days yeah. later, his nephew. 
Yes. Um, but he's also a very quiet and introspective man. He's not really a political animal. Mm. Um, he gave an interview to a journalist who he knows well personally, and that's basically it thus far. Um, he has written um, yesterday, one of the Israeli TV channels scooped out a letter, a very harsh letter, well thought out that he has said to the prime minister and to the cabinet, basically accusing them of failing in the aims of this war. Mm. Again, he has the stature to do that. But, you know, for, I mean, I have several things to say. One is, if Netanyahu can avoid it, there's not going to be an election in Israel. Yeah, okay? I understand and that. Not, yeah. And I'm not I'm just talking about in the next few months. Clearly, if he, he does anything to do it, there's certainly not going to be an election, let's say, in the next six months. But if we go back to where Netanyahu was six months ago, he was trying to establish a regime in Israel. Yes. It, it's unclear what kind of elections would take place and with what frequency. Mm. Okay? Really, right. truly an autocratic regime. So I think we have to keep that in mind. When we talk casually about after the next election, let's keep in mind that that's something, in my opinion, as I see it, that's something that's still, while it's it's true it's enshrined in Israeli law, I think that's something that's going to have to be fought for pretty hard. Um, some people are aware of this. I want to give the example of um, Arnon Barzadi. You're you're breaking up on us a little uh, bit. Yeah. Okay. I, let's see if if your um, if your audio is holding up. If not, we'll come back to you. Try again. Okay. I think I think Noga is going through a. Uh, 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 not a difficult reception area. That's fine. So, which gives us a chance to turn to Danny Seidman, and he held up a nice circle uh, when I asked what the possibilities were for uh, such a development in in Israeli polity. Can you give us your sense of of where Israeli um, policy is going on these issues in in the coming months and years. I would say that the answer to, that, the oh, answer hold on. to that is unknowable. Oh. It's not merely unknown, it's unknowable. Okay. Unknowable. Okay. Um uh, but you held up you I, held up a zero. So please explain what you mean by that. I come to this issue not as somebody who's seeking peace. Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe that before the war. And Speak believe, a little louder, please, Danny. It's hard I, to hear. I, I believed the, before the war, and oh, I excellent. believe now wow. that the greatest existential threat confronting Israel in this generation is not the alliance between Iran, Hezbollah, and Gaza, which I treat very seriously. It is perpetual occupation. Israel will end occupation, or occupation will be the end of us. Hmm. Nothing in that principle has changed since October 7th. Mm -hmm. It is an existential imperative to end occupation in a manner that's compatible with the national interests of both sides. There's been a lot of talk correctly about the traumatization of Israeli society. We had glimpses of the Holocaust yeah. for not one moment forget that my friends on the other side of town in Jerusalem are equally traumatized yeah. uh, as well. You, you cannot go anywhere unless you know where you're going. Right. And where we're going is ending occupation. And the occupation ends in one way, one way alone. It ends at a border. Yep. There are no two ways of ending occupation. I may not live to see that border, mm -hmm. but it is an imperative to work towards it. And and you think at the eventually... moment, yeah. Sorry. At the moment, yeah. neither the Israeli public nor the Palestinian public has the emotional capability of dealing with that. Yeah. I, fundament, I believe in, in the fundamental decency 
of Israeli society and Palestinian society that we can overcome that. You can't overcome it by ignoring it. You need a North Star. It will be long. It will be difficult. It will know failures. Uh, the fact that those changes are happening now, I believe, is encouraging. I am pleased with the way the Biden administration is engaging, but nothing will replace the realization on the Palestinian and Israeli sides we have to proceed to the end of occupation without ignoring the equities and the interests of either. Yeah, and this is what Professor Baram was saying, you know, that security has Son to be a key be feature. Uh, Noga, I'd like you to finish your thought before we lost you, and then I'm going to go to questions. I want to remind everybody, you can submit your questions in writing through the Q&A function. I will curate them, and we'll start that. But I want to give uh, Noga a chance, please. To hear me now, yeah, we can, we can can hear, hear you. Me. Give it a shot. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. I was talking about this kind of shattering. No? Okay. So, yes. um, I, again, I don't think it's going to be immediate, and I don't think we're going to see a radical change of the structure, let's say, of Israeli partisan politics within weeks. But I think that we might within a year or two. In, in other words, I think that the catastrophe of October 7th and the subsequent war um, may have these opened these kind of cleavages, caverns in the Israeli polity that will allow a different sort of leader to emerge. I also think that from the protest movement and from the um, actions of the reservists who are now coming home, we see maybe the burgeoning, the initial signs of, of a different sort of political discourse that may become possible mm. in Israel. That said, um, while Netanyahu's base is ever smaller, it's also ever more radical and I think ever more dangerous. So for example, in recent weeks, we've seen something that is really stomach turning, which is the government, the top officials of the government managing a slanderous, a dangerous, slanderous, violent messaging campaign against families who've lost children as soldiers in the war or who lost them in the attack of October 7th or families who have loved ones as hostages still in Gaza. The government is, is attacking, in other words, its most vulnerable, its most hurting citizens. What are and they saying? Say, what are they doing? Describe that for a second, because I think a lot of us outside of Israel don't know much about it. Well, I'll describe something that happened yesterday that I've, I've seen this video maybe four times because I just can't get over it. Rami okay. Ben Yehuda, Rami Ben Yehuda, who is a Likud, uh, let's say, firebrand. He's a Netanyahu fanboy. He's a repellent, disgusting figure the worst of the worst. And yet, for some reason, he always finds him. He's never been elected to anything. He's, his role in life is to be a public firebrand. He basically transmits messaging that comes from the prime minister's son, who is the wow. number one messenger, message creator um, of his father's regime. And so yesterday, he went to the tent where the families of hostages are huddling in the cold, outside the military headquarters in Tel Aviv, and he confronted a man called Yaakov Godun, a man whose son, Tom, was murdered in, on October 7th and who has really associated himself with the plight of the hostages and their families. And he videotaped himself screaming obscenities at this guy and screaming, you're comparing idea of soldiers to Nazis. You're an enemy of Israel. Now, until very recently in Israeli history, a bereaved father was an almost sacred figure mm. in the state, something untouchable. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I do want to say, I, I do see signs of a possible in the future. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, this is this is the, uh, the downside of having someone join us from a taxi. But... Uh, we will, we will again, we'll try to come back to Noga. With... Okay, Noga, we lost you. 
We lost you for a second again. You were talking about the status of bereaved fathers in Israeli culture. If if you yeah. can, let's try it one more time. Yeah, I mean, this is something that was just say the, the unheard of before. Of, yeah. You know, bereaved families were something. Yeah. yeah, it was something sacred until fairly recently. Right. Um, and this Netanyahu regime has besmirched even that. But okay. what I want to say also, and I think yeah. this is another danger facing Israel, is that the way this gentleman's attack against his father was transmitted in the media mm. was pretty equanimous. Okay, here's this Likud activist. This is what he said. And then a family member would say this is disgusting and awful. There's not outrage. So I think that the general Israeli public is remains just shell-shocked. But yeah. I think that the media is doing this government a lot of favors by normalizing it, using terminology that Israelis are accustomed to from previous conflicts and previous wars to describe what is a completely abnormal and extremist situation today. Okay, that, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. I'm going to shift now. And I, again, uh, if you want, we've got some very good questions. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who wants to ask a question uh, or make a comment, uh, do it through the Q&A function. Um, there's one here that I'm just going to go ahead and answer uh, because it's something that people should know and often they don't know. Uh, Raymond Termini asks, who is authorized by the Palestinians to speak on their behalf? It's a very simple question to answer. The Palestine Liberation Organization represents the Palestinian people diplomatically. There is not a single Palestinian, Arab, or international document that doesn't say that. And uh, the even Hamas accepts this principle. They criticize the PLO's positions a lot. They don't question the PLO's status as the representative of the Palestinians diplomatically because that presence, the PLO's global presence, is one of the few concrete achievements of the Palestinian national movement since 1967 when it reformed itself. Uh, and uh, it's something really Israel can't take away from it. And whoever controls that presence, which is the non-member observer state status in the General Assembly and all 130 or so embassies and missions around the world speaks for the Palestinians internationally. And I think one of the reasons Hamas did what it did on October 7th is part of a long-term effort to be you know, take over the national movement and get that crown jewel, get control of that d diplomatic voice and speak for the Palestinian people. So the answer is the PLO, for better or worse. There really isn't a debate about that. Uh, now, uh, Richard Widemouth asks, Mr. Baram, what Arab nation would you trust to administer Gaza? Since you talked about uh, kind of Arab or international administration, what do you have in mind? What do you think the Israeli public would, would kind of go for? Okay. Uh, before the uh, uh, Abraham Agreement and all that, I visited uh, on an Israeli passport. Uh, Oman, uh, when uh, Sultan, Sultan Qaboos was still alive, very yeah. popular, he was, by the way, found out. I speak Arabic, I speak to people, nobody was following me. And Bahrain. Uh, I would add to it, uh, the, of course, the, the, the Arab Emirates, obviously. Now, with Oman, Israel has no relations, even though, as I said, I came there on an Israeli passport. But uh, even even though we don't have yet with them any diplomatic relations, I would I would basically trust them, and I would even not even, but I would definitely trust the Saudis. I have no problem with that. Again, no diplomatic relations, yes, but uh, I would trust their judgment, and uh, I could add Morocco, if you wish. Uh, Sudan is now in turmoil, so I don't know, and I would add also Egypt. Yeah, you so would need Egypt, Egypt to be on board, maybe right? Egypt, maybe Egypt in the first place. So, you need again, Egypt if you're going to do something in Gaza. It's got to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Egypt is indispensable. Yeah. I mean, can't do anything without Egypt. You can't do anything without we have to work. We have to work more closely with them. Right now, uh, our, our the heads of the heads of state in Egypt and our head of state or prime mm. minister are not, not on speaking terms, which in itself is a great pity. The point is, yes, you have Arab states. I also would need definitely America. Mm. I, I I would be delighted to have Germany, France, and Britain join in. 
you 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 yeah. do have a body of of of, of powerful and peaceful and and the reason the very reasonable nations more than that that you can work with and i would start working with them right now on what to do mm-hmm. so that, okay uh that i hope that happens i'm skeptical uh, but i think it's a very important thing and i hope it happens andrew apostolo my dear friend a brilliant guy um asked this in 20 2003 arthur hertzberg called for punitive economic measures against the settlements proposing uh, a deduction of the cost of subsidizing settlements from U.S. assistance to Israel. Are such measures supplemented by trade sanctions on goods and services using inputs from settlements necessary to force the Israeli government to finally reverse the settlement enterprise? That's his question. And I'll begin with uh, you, Danny, and then I want to hear all of you on this because it's a very interesting mm-hmm. question. I am not motivated by a visceral hatred of settlers. Right. Some of my friends are settlers, yeah. if I think hard. Having said that, settlements are illegal. They are in contravention to Israeli, to international law. Mm-hmm. Israel has been given a pass on violations of international law. That has not been good for Israel. If you deflect holding Israel accountable for things beyond the green line, you are inviting the delegitimization of Israel inside the green line. I think that countries and individuals and organizations should follow their consciences and interests. And that is to hold Israel accountable It, for what it is doing in contravention to international law. No more, no less. And not punitive, mm-hmm. saying if you engage in concrete steps towards de-occupation, towards mm-hmm. ending occupation, we will understand that. But you cannot expect international legitimacy and perpetual occupation at the same time. Bring it on. Okay. Uh, Noga, do you think that these kind of pressures would, would work or would they be ineffective? Uh, what do you make of them? Mixed feelings. Um, I, you may disagree with me. I consider the international BDS movement one of the least successful activist movements that I've ever observed. No, I agree with to that. My... <laughs> I think oh, that's okay. obviously so, correct. So to my understanding, right, its aim was to affect Israel economically, and during the years of its existence, Israel has boomed economically. Yeah, no, it's a total failure, yeah. Yeah, so that said, I have to say, I I think that the White House's um, initial steps against specific settlers who are not, who have not, who are accused very seriously of violent crimes, Mm. in one case against an American citizen, and who have not been tried by the Israeli system. And we see that um, this is kind of a pincer movement because the United States announced these sanctions followed immediately by American allied nations announcing more severe uh, but similar sanctions. I think this is very clever. I think it's, first of all, necessary for the reasons that Danny just outlined. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's a slap to Netanyahu and it's one he can't fight back. Because uh. what lies behind this sanction, what lies behind this sanction is the United States, to use an example, saying these guys are not being put, the, the Israeli judiciary is failing in hmm. its duty, right? If these guys had been charged and put on trial, the United States would not be able no. to sanction yeah, them. No, it wouldn't have done anything, no. And so at the same time that it is a slap at the extremist kind of impunity of settlers, It is also a slap at Netanyahu, who mm. has spent the last decade or so attempting to handicap the Israeli military. He can't be responsible to that as I can't do what he's tried to do in the past. The President Biden, we have a robust judiciary. These guys have been put on trial. So mm. I think it's very clever. And I also like Danny. I mean, I think countries should proceed in that way, in a way that does not um, appear. It can't be perceived by Israelis as an attack 
against the whole country. The way, by the way, Smotrich, Israel's extremist mm. hooligan, uh, you know, former terrorist finance minister, when these sanctions were initially announced, he came out and he said, "This is these are sanctions against all Israelis. And that messaging has failed. It's important yeah. to say that. Israelis are not buying it. So the and more so, targeted and politically wise th these uh, pressures are, the more useful they could be. They can be and are, in your view, right? I think so. But I also have to say, yes, they, that is true. I also think that internally in Israel, there's going to have to be a lot more pressure. And it's also going to have to be a lot more clever. It can't be a kind of blanket peace now yeah. motion. But if I'll give you an example of something that Please. has bothered me for many years. Israel has become a kind of little little pearl in the new world wine industry worldwide. An interesting terroir that blends ancient uh, varietals with new methods, et cetera, et cetera. But what's going on in Israel is that um, wineries and vintners operating in the West Bank have extraordinarily extraordinary tax benefits hmm. and regulatory benefits compared to the struggling vintners in Israel proper. And this is something um, that I think, I, you know, I think there should be a movement, for example, within this very popular and internationally recognized industry to say, screw it. Why do we have to pay a price when the guy who does this, you know, 20 kilometers across the green line is getting a benefit I'm not getting? I think we're going to have to see more and more grassroots movements that also are clever and are specific and are unarguable. Okay. Um, so I think that's we're very gonna clear. Standards. All right, that's very clear. Professor Baram, do you think that these kinds of things can be helpful in any way or are they negative? Or are they positive? Or what do you make of it all? It uh, depends if we are talking about individual cases or cases of individuals, uh, or we are talking about uh, uh, boycotting a whole nation like the well, whole yeah, or, or there's something in between, which is trying to boycott settlements, which, you know, doing your best to target yes. them. So uh, yeah. discuss all, here, all three, please. Here is something which on which I seem to be at a certain difference from my colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the only thing that is friendly countries can do to help Israel is they can boycott anybody they want except settlements which have been settled there by government decision. In other words, Israel is a democracy. And when the government decided to establish this or that settlement, and this is going through Knesset and through the whole committees uh, concerned and so on, this is an Israeli government decision, even though I am against it. It doesn't matter. It's a democracy. And it decided to do that. There are so many settlements which are illegal by Israeli law. Yep. That's the point. When you do something regarding those settlements, uh, I don't think I don't see a problem. However, I have to would say, it be helpful though? Uh, it's difficult to say. Some yeah. Israelis said 50, 50 50. About half Israeli will say, "Well, listen, this is illegal. <laughs> so hey, why can we? Why should we object to it?" Or others will say, "No, this is the land of our forefathers, uh, yeah. David, and Solomon, and so on." So sure. I don't know. What I'm right. saying is, it's, if, if anybody wants to do something, that's the way to do it. Only okay. on legal settlements as decided by the Israeli democratically elected yeah. government. One more thing about yeah. individuals. Look, I have no clue whether what are the, what are the uh, accusations against those individuals, individuals only four so, so far, who have been boycotted by, by America and, and France and so on. My view is purely legal. Uh, if, if, if you accuse somebody of something, if the state or if the American uh, Department of State or accuses somebody in Israel of certain thing, they don't have to prove their innocence. The Department of State has to, to prove, to show to us that they are guilty. And if, the part of it, if they show us that they are guilty and they decide not to allow them to go to America or to close down their accounts or whatever, then very well. And you need to have some authority that will say, yeah, these claims are actually proven. They're actually right. So in other words, 
it's it's very complicated when a country is doing that without any public proof. Hmm. I would like, even just in Israel, as a citizen in Israel, I'd like to see the proof. And if the proof is convincing, I'd say, well, listen, hey, this is an American business. They can do it. Uh, I wouldn't accept it if there is no proof. But hmm. but but on principle, they can do it. But okay. again, if you want to create in Israel a very strong anti-American or anti-European or anti-everybody's, mm-hmm. uh, everybody, you you should do it in a blanket style. Blanket boycotts, yeah. You blanket boycott, and then uh, forget it. It won't work. Yeah. It'll unite Israelis in opposition. I understand. Okay, so uh, we have a great question from Monica Marx, uh, Professor Monica Marx, who's a, a great friend also. Um, and she asks really kind of a key question. Um, based on your understanding, and this is for all three of you, based on your understanding of Israeli society, what would be the smartest way for the Palestinian national movement to proceed now? What should they do? What What's smart for them? Uh, you seem to have uh, thoughts, Professor Baram. So let's begin with you, even though we just heard from you. Let's continue. Go right ahead. Very, It's very simple, and it's very hard. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi succeeded in India to push the British out. Incredible. Mm-hmm. And I would say, first of all, absolutely non-violence. Non-violence. Can, can it be easy? No. It can be for the Palestinian leaders to do that. Mm-hmm. No support for terrorism. Not just no support. Denunciation mm-hmm. of any terrorism. These are the basic things that we as Israel will say, wait a minute, we see some light at the end of the tunnel. And beyond that, if you pay if you pay the salary of a murderer because he murdered, that's that it's not encouraging anybody to show this kind of so right. I would say well they're they're supporting uh, families of people who are in prison. So you know that it's it's a it looks very different from the other side of the border, you know. Of course it does. Of, of course it does. Yeah. But give I'll give you an example. If a if a, a Jewish person well, a Jewish is going into an Arab village on the West yeah. Bank. He's burning the village, the village, he's burning the house, the home. Yeah. He's burning a whole family in that home. Yeah. He's being brought to trial. He's found guilty. He's going to jail, okay? Mm. Because we don't have death penalty. Yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah. To, jail. He goes to jail. And then the minister of the, 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 ch- the chancellor of the exchequer, yeah. the minister of finance, is saying, ah, because his family is without the provider, I'm going to pay them. Twenty thousand or forty thousand. Yeah, yeah. I know. I understand, but but then it, 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 I understand. What... It, it looks terrible. I get that. But uh, did Baruch Goldstein's family get cut off from all social services? I I kind of doubt it. Listen, listen, listen. The usual social services, and no, right. And I'm right. not, not uh, advo- advocating it. Right. But I, to get I understand. A special treatment because your your husband murdered a few Jewish people, civilians of all of all. That's to my mind. Okay, I I, under, I understand. No, you're making a good point about how it looks, and and this is pretty uh, pretty standard in Israel. This is the standard kind of Israeli reaction. So it's very important to say it. Palestinians yeah. need to think about it and maybe uh, change their behavior. I don't know, but but uh, I would say one thing about Gandhi. Gandhi and the, his followers were very nonviolent. But there was a lot of violence surrounding him. Bos was not nonviolent. There was a lot of violence in India at the time. So it wasn't like India, the Indian independence movement was strictly nonviolent. That the one big part of it and its main leader was nonviolent. But there were a lot of others uh, who were violent. Agree, so, you know, I agree. I agree 100 percent. That's correct. a problem. You know, but so what, Palestinians but, would have to do something unique, like which is see, be entirely but, nonviolent. Yeah, I agree. But we would like to see the leader, what he yeah. says, how he behaves. Yeah. He should set an example. Yeah, and yeah, I understand that. that. Yeah. And he so, was an example, that's all. Uh, no, I understand. Well, uh, Abbas kind of built his career around opposing violence, but I understand what you're saying. You're saying nonviolence as opposed to something different and, and resistance. That's very smart. Um, Danny, what what do you think? What what should the Palestinian National Movement do under the current circumstances? What would be smart? What would get them to the next phase, if anything? This may sound glib, but it's none of my business. 
Okay. <laughs> is is but, Israel, no, 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 but, but hold on, hold on. I understand it. But let me let me stop you there. I'm not okay. asking you to dictate to Palestinians. I'm saying, look, you understand Israeli society in a way that Palestinians don't, or very few Palestinians <clears throat> do. So what would your advice be if a friendly Palestinian said to you, Danny, what should we do? Would you say it's none of my business, you decide? You might. I very, I very much hope that Palestinians will be able to reach out to Israeli society. Okay. But under current circumstances, where both societies are hemorrhaging, I think it's inappropriate to make suggestions. Fair enough. They need to recover, and we need to recover. Yeah. It's going to take a generation or two for Palestinians to, to get yeah, past. I, I, I think you will find that both societies, uh, and I believe in the fundamental decency of both Israeli society and Palestinian society, oh, have, it, have it within them to recover. It's not idyllic. It's painful. Right. It's bleeding. But it is possible. possible. Secondly, don't wait for us. And okay. don't wait for the international community. Uh, this is you right. have the tools of governance. See? And if they're not enough, take them. You know, I specialize in East Jerusalem. There yeah. is no political activity that is legal in East Jerusalem, except for voting for the mayor who they can't become. Make space for legitimate, nonviolent political activity in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. We have crushed any political activity more radical than a scout meeting. And we have crushed scout meetings. Freedom and governance are to be taken. They're not given. Yeah. Do it nonviolently. And when you feel it's appropriate, address us above the heads of your leaders and our leaders, and we will do our best to listen and vice versa. I knew you had it in you to give excellent advice, and you just did. Noga, what about you? What do you think? Well, um, before I address exactly that, I want to respond to what Professor Baram said and, and your response about the Palestinian prisoners. Israel doesn't have a policy, a national policy, of funding the lives of families of people accused of murdering Palestinians. That is true. However, however, we have sitting ministers mm -hmm. and sitting members of parliament who are allies, close sure. allies of the current prime minister. Tzvi Sukkot is merely one example. Horrific, horrifically, the minister in charge of national security is an example, yeah. who yeah. have whipped up murderous, Efforts, you know, I mean, sure. all all three of the guys I just mentioned, Smotrich, Sukkot, they're the ones calling to wipe Hawara off the earth yeah, just yeah. very recently. And these guys are rewarded. They yeah, are ministers of state. So I think that we have to be able to take responsibility for this kind of aberrant behavior on both sides. I, I just think the problem in uh, Palestine. The way murderers can be compensated, but I think we have a real problem also in Israel. So I just wanted no. to say that. No, that's a very important point, and I, and I agree you, with you. Uh, but but talk more broadly, please, about what Palestinians can and should do now, from your perspective as an Israeli. What do you think would help them to do? What would behoove them to do? Um, I want to mention two two things that have given me inspiration uh, in recent days. One is Mohammed Ahlan's interview with the New York Times which mm -hmm. I recommend that everybody read, uh, written by Patrick Kingsley and Adam Rasgon, an mm -hmm. important interview, a real vision for a sovereign Palestinian future side by side with Israel, a realistic vision by mm -hmm. someone who not only is right now intimately tied into the UAE and Gulf state security vision, but remains also an important Palestinian voice. So, I think that if we're talking about realism, we can listen to his voice yeah. and see that there are influential Palestinians who are already starting to conceive of a, a nation with sovereign structure that that could rise. I think that's I, very important. And I want to give a very different example. OK. OK, well, I, I, I recommend. A, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Noga. I thought you were done. I just want to finish. Last night, I yeah. attended a political event in Jerusalem. It was a campaign, a small, like a town hall for a candidate. 
Oh, well. She oh. is. Hello. Yeah, you're cutting in and out on us, but okay. So you attended this this uh, this campaign. Event. I attended a town hall meeting. There, yeah. there are municipal elections in Israel in a couple of weeks. Yep. I attended an event for an, a serious, legitimate Arab candidate for the Jerusalem City Council, who mm -hmm. is really trying hard to drum up votes among Arabs, which is crucial in Jerusalem yeah. yep. and among Jews. She makes a serious argument, and I found. Um, my my encounter with her was inspiring for me, and I hope that we will see more and more political voices of her type. What's arising. her name? Her name is Sundos Al Hout. Okay, we'll remember that Sundos Al Hout. Thank you very and much her, for that. Her electoral her her mm. list for the Jerusalem City Council is called Daf. Okay, and um, yeah, right. I think that that. Both of those seem to be important voices right now. That's that's very helpful. All right, I want to close with a final. Yeah, we'll come to you for. Okay, so, Professor Baram, and then we're going to do one final question. Go ahead, Professor. I, I'll answer. I'll. I, I don't disagree. I agree with Noga. Basically, on the present government, well, that's mm. that's a disaster. So there's mm. no question here. However, Noga, with all due respect, Israel had never had such a government before, never, ever. Right. We have a horrible government. Go back one year, just one year, and you have Balev as, as Minister of Domestic Security. Compare Balev to Ben Gvir, even though Bar and Ben is just, uh, the same word. So bringing Ben Gvir and uh, Smotrich as an example of how the Palestinians shouldn't change is to my mind in itself a disastrous way of speaking and thinking. Professor, I, say, but I don't, I don't I think that's what you know what was saying, though. To, this is a big mistake. Say but whatever no, say about the government. But no, but were you saying that, though? I didn't hear that. Do, no, but she said, look at what is happening in the Israeli government. Oh, look I how hard Okay, are. okay. Professor, right. but, um, I understand. Professor, but, um, but, um, no, no, but, um, hold, hold on. Let, let's hear from Noga for a second, and we'll come back to to you. Professor. Go ahead, Noga. I in no way, I in no way use Ben Gvir as an example for anything. But and you not did. As an but you well, did. You just now did. Baham, let me speak. But you said it. You said no. it. You okay, okay. But let, let's go let her clarify. Me. No, let, let, let me just clarify her views. If she, if she wants to clarify, it's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Clarify. I have, I have one more sentence. Hold, hold take, on. Hold on. Professor, take, I want to come back to you. Okay, go ahead. Take MK, Knesset member Abbas, mm -hmm. who, who was a Muslim brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look at still. him. Look at his yeah. behavior. Yeah, yeah. He is, to my mind, the future. Okay. That that makes a lot of sense, actually, also. But he's sort of following Shas, you know, into the Knesset to get money, but then he has to be reasonable in Us order to are do not that. so big in many yeah. ways. No, no. I, I'm, I agree with you. I, I'm not but saying for anything me, For me, it. Abbas is the example of the future. I, I, sure, it's it, for Palestinian citizens of Israel. It's definitely the way to go. Uh, Noga, you wanted to clarify your views, but I still have one final question, which we haven't gotten to. But go ahead, Noga. I, I just, I just want to say, I really, um, I, I don't know where Professor Baram extrapolated what I said in this direction. Um, and I, all I was trying to say, and I will repeat it. I believe Please. it that if Israel's Israel is in its place to accuse Palestinian government of behaving in a distasteful or dangerous way vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian prisoners, but the state of Israel, um, and you know, its current government is its current government. We, it is the most extreme, but it is the one in power right okay. now. No, Pre okay. That, Sorry, right. the previous government was barely a blip in an ocean of Netanyahu 16 years. So I think the Israelis also, we as Israel, as a state, have to absolutely take responsibility for allowing extremist actions and statements to go unpunished. I think it's sure. ABC. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think both of you are making important points, actually. No, you don't think so, Professor. Okay. But you've made it clear. You've made it clear why you don't think so. So we don't have to go back over it because... Yeah, so it's a point of disagreement, which is helpful because we've had a lot of convergence here. Uh, final question, which is po uh, posed by uh, Bandar al Sharhan, but it's, it was also going to be my question. So that's helpful, which is 
Where do you see Israel and Gulf state normalization headed, especially with the current government in Israel and also the hardening of the Saudi position and to some extent even the American position on on uh, uh, what has to happen to make this normalization possible? Uh, let's let's begin with you, uh, Danny, and then we'll go to Noga and Professor Baram can have the last word. I engaged in antisocial behavior when I expressed reservations about normalization. Look, I'm an Israeli, I am a Zionist, I don't hide that. And I think that Zionism among else is assuming our rightful place among the family of nations. How can you possibly ignore you know, uh, the Emirati or Bahraini recognition of Israel? I oppose it not because of it, but because it was used as a lever to marginalize the Palestinian question, to basically allow Netanyahu to say, peace, of course you could have peace, but without the Palestinians. I thought that was mistaken, and I think that whatever else, it became evident on October 7th. October 7th, however, provides an alternative. It is not that I expect or want Arab states to walk away from Israel and to walk away from normalization. On the contrary, people are talking about what's going to happen in Ramadan as if it's a potential nuclear device. It is. The Saudis and the Emiratis and the Bahrainis have a stake in Al-Aqsa. I'm not telling them, bash Israel, harness your relations with Israel in order to build a more constructive Middle East. Okay. I would hope that the states that have engaged in normalization or about to won't abandon it but will harness it in the direction of a resolution of this conflict. There is no walking away. Don't you think we're seeing signs of that, by the way? Yes. I think we're seeing signs that this is, can no longer be ignored in Washington. I think we're seeing that. signs in Riyadh and Dubai. I also think that people have short memories and given the opportunity, everybody will forget. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Barama, I would like to come to you on this. What about prospects for Israel in the Gulf and uh, all of that? At the moment, there is a hiatus. I think yeah. you pronounce it this way. You do. I... And as long, as long as there is a hot war, very hot war in Gaza, and uh, warm to hot war in the north, uh, everything is on hold. No, that's understandable. In the future, I think that eventually we shall go back to where we were before the 7th of October. Namely, relations with the Gulf states will continue, maybe lower profile, but will continue uh, unless something horrible happens, hopefully not. Of course. And and uh, I think that the Gulf states and the Saudis and the Moroccans and so will, will, will uh, apply pressure on us to move forward along the Palestinian issue. And I have no problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I see things picking up later. But I do, I do agree, what shall I say, that without <laughs> resolving the Palestinian issue in a way that both sides can live with it, both sides, the Palestinians, the Israelis, have to, by the end of the process, have to be reasonably unhappy. Reasonably yeah. unhappy. <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it. And, and when do we reach that point, I, I, I'm not pessimistic. I'm actually optimistic. But it will take time. It will take time. So I, I'm glad to say I share all almost. I agree with almost everything you just said. Uh, Noga, what do you think? What about the future of you know, where does this stand between Israel and the Gulf countries? Well, I agree with all of you. I, I agree with you saying that I think we're already seeing Gulf states um, using the leverage of their new and important ties to Israel 
to nudge, let's say, or to even mm -hmm. compel Israel in a direction Israel didn't want to go. I think that's part of the kind of diplomatic pincer movement that I think is a positive sign. Um, I want to say something else. It may be a little bit outside our purview, but I still think, I actually think that the Palestinians, Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian president made a mistake with the Abraham Accords. And I think it would have oh, no been question. beneficial. Sorry? But they know that. You can see Do how they? They, were, they were trying to get involved in the Saudi conversations while staying distant. But they know they made a mistake. Go ahead. So just I wanted to say that I think they made a mistake. I think it I hope there will be a Palestinian leader who can rectify that. And I think that when I'm speaking in the whole in a hopeful way about about that kind of a leader, um, I think that is the sort of le a leader who can say, you know what, we're joining these accords. We welcome these nations who, like us, recognized Israel. Let's move forward. I think it would have given and it can still give significant power and presence on the international stage to Palestine. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important step. And I think that that, too, will um, push Israel. Again, we keep talking about pushing Israel. So I want to end my comments in this. I, I believe that none of what we're talking about is possible as long as Netanyahu manages to hold on power. Um, I'm not a particular believer in the strongman theory of politics, but I do have to say, I think it's important right now to say that the Israeli political system was not built to withstand a figure like Netanyahu. And we see it, as, as each of us have said in one way or another, we see the system collapsing under the weight of his assault. So everything that we're talking about, in my view, hinges on him being out of politics. And by that, I don't just mean his government toppled, which would be a step. By that, I mean him out of politics. His presence is toxic. He has galvanized around him basically kind of Israeli proud boys who now hold the levers of power in the state. It's a very dangerous situation. And I don't believe Israel will be able to free itself from its current predicament so long as he is a real factor in the political arena. Yeah. So obviously everything you just said resonated in, in the United States because we have a kind of an analogous problem here. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to thank all three of you for joining us. Really smart comments, exceptionally powerful I got everything I wanted out of the ideal panel uh, to provide us with a range of Israeli perspectives. There are obviously many more, but these are really important. We're going to move on to the Palestinians next, and uh, then we'll probably circle back and talk to some Gulf people again, because this crisis requires constant um, attention and, and uh, examination. So thank you all very much. Um, see you, uh, everybody, again next time. Thanks for everyone for watching and asking. Thank you. Questions. Thank you for Goodbye. hosting us. Same. Thank you very much. Noga, Professor Baram, Danny Seidemann, you guys are great.